Tonight on Joy News Prime, time is running out. The cry of professional health groups as they appeal to the Ministry of Health to immediately commence processes for the procurement of vaccines in order to contain the outbreak of measles in some parts of the country. They're not getting the vaccines that they need to help them to even pre yes, prevent them from getting the infection. So we are heading into a dangerous zone. We, will be, we are talking now. The sixth president, Akufado, is promising to restore Ghana's economy to its glory days as the country marks 66 years of breaking free from colonial rule. 66 years down the line, we've worked hard to live up to this responsibility, even though we acknowledge that we have not fully realized our potential and the dreams and aspirations of our forebears who fought for the independent Ghana we have today. We have more from the president. Meanwhile, former president John Romani Mahama is taking a swipe at government for making the Independence Day celebration what he calls a partisan one. We'll bring you that reaction, but the Independence Day celebration did not go as planned in Nalerigu Gambaga and Waliwali in the northeast region. Nation divided cannot stand. And people so divided cannot also stand. We therefore need to be conscious of our actions and reactions that constitute a serious threat to the peace we are enjoying. And join us Prime is on DSTV Channel 421, Go TV Channel 144. We have these stories plus business and sports coming up in the next one hour. Please stay. And tonight, time is running out. The cry of professional health groups uh, who are appealing to the Ministry of Health to immediately commence processes for the procurement of three essential vaccines which are in short supply in almost all public hospitals across the country. Already 16 districts in the north uh, parts of the country have recorded cases of uh, measles which could have been prevented if these essential uh, drugs were made available by the Ministry. Well, Johnny says Mami A.C. Thompson tells the story of how how many more lactating mothers uh, have been crisscrossing the country facing difficulties in immunizing these toddlers? After a month, nursing mother Florence Kwabla is back to the vaccination center at the Adabaka Polyclinic with her baby girl, Gladys. Florence is here to get Gladys' weight checked and her vaccination shot. She recorded a healthy weight. However, the oral polio vaccine due her is still not available for her baby. The last time she was here, she was told it was finished. Play with the polio. Worries me a lot because the first day we came, they said, there is a shortage. Then uh, one month time we came, they said there is a shortage. So I asked them, can I, there's, is there any available at any, but they said there's still shortage at some of the polyclinics and hospitals. Another worried mother is Gifty Odonko. Her four month old baby in Shira has also not received the polio and the rotavirus vaccines. She wants government to quickly restock. I'm told there is no polio vaccine, so we'd have to return without the shot. It could expose her to diseases. I hope we can get it at the pharmacy to protect her. Parliament's Health Committee took a strong stand to deal with shortages across the country. Committee Chair Dr. Efriye Ayu agrees that no child should be exempt from vaccination. We are concerned because every life matters. And just as many of us here feel our sustainability has more been because of the vaccines we had at childbirth. We cannot deprive any Ghanaian that opportunity to leave. And the absence of vaccines in the community's thinking is inexcusable or unpardonable. Well, 
The Ghana Health Service Director, Dr. Patrick Kumar Bwaji, has assured stores will be replenished in two weeks. Meanwhile, the Pediatric Society of Ghana says time is running out. President-elect of the group, Dr. Hilda Mantevia Boli, says the Ministry of Health must take immediate steps to address the challenge. Yes, I mean, there were reports of a few one-offs, one-offs, but then if other facilities have it, then people just go there. So it wasn't anything major until suddenly we realized that it was widespread, and that is when people also started having the infections and all and so we had so to you also come up didn't inform the authorities no 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 okay. so if we are looking at responsibility whose job it is to ensure that there are no shortages of vaccines right. the ministry of health like you mentioned i mean that is they have that oversight the government they have that oversight okay so they have to they work with the epi they work with all the relevant bodies and they work with the various facilities as well to ensure that we have stock i dare say that it's somebody's job to ensure that we do not get to this point where people are recording shortages because we've been running this for many years in this country and if somehow every time we have had vaccines how come this time we don't have vaccines or there are shortages. I mean, you can't tell me that we couldn't predict that exchange rates was becoming a problem, a problem that funds was becoming a problem. And generally all over the country now, we know that all over the world there, there are hardships, but we are saying that the children should be prioritized. And whoever is supposed to ensure that budgeting for vaccines is done, the monetary allocation is there, should do their job and make sure that they are there. Because already we have an issue with malnutrition because of the hardships, the current hardships. How much is an egg today? How much is meat today, a pound of meat, fish? I mean, how are people going to, and all these, you see, when your immune system goes down, then you are more likely to have infections. And so we as a society are already worried about malnutrition and all those other social problems that are developing as a result of the hardship. Right. And this vaccine issue is only going to compound things because you have children who have background mal some background malnutrition, their immune systems are already down, and they are not getting the vaccines that they need to help them to even pre yes, prevent them from getting the infection. So, we are heading into a dangerous zone. We, will be, we are talking now and we'll be talking more and more. Mm. And even if you get it, you are likely to get a milder form mm. compared to somebody who hasn't been vaccinated. And that's why it's really important. The BCG vaccine, which is for tuberculosis, for example, when we give the BCG vaccine, it doesn't prevent the children from getting tuberculosis at all. It just prevents them from getting like very severe forms or forms that spread. So let's say to the brain, to the bones, it prevents them from getting such kinds of tuberculosis. So it's really about protection. And it's like maximal protection in some cases and very good protection to prevent totally in other cases. This is a public health intervention somebody's illness can infect you and you could have your money but you could die right. and many children come from homes where there's not enough money we know we have nhis but even that we have problems and we are even hoping that children under five years of age will have health care for free please don't think of asking people to pay for vaccines because it will be a public health disaster as it stands even with this shortage right. Look at what we are seeing. How much more if we go to a point where we have the vaccines, but people are not able to afford it? This, please, nobody should talk about. So it's a no-go area for in terms yes, of. Yes, it's payment. a no-go area. I do not think that children should be asked to pay for vaccines. No, no, not at all. It's the least that the government can do for its future. Protect your children. How hard is that? And that's a plea from the Pediatric Society. Let's try and get some answers now. Joining us is Isaac uh, Ofei Bar, he's a uh, public relations officer at the Ministry of Health. Thank you, sir, uh, for your time here on Joy News Prime. The health minister, as we understand, uh, was unable to answer uh, questions in, relations, uh, in relation to this particular issue last week. Uh, are you able to explain to us uh, what accounted for that? Um, good evening to your cherished viewers. And, um I must say that um, the, the Ministry of Health has taken notice of the shortage of the vaccines in the system. 
And I would also want to say that the Honorable Minister Nobu Kwekwaji Manen personally has taken the issue um, to ensure to deal with it, to make sure that as soon as possible, the Ghana Health Service, the people of Ghana, will receive the vaccines in adequacy. Mm. So what you mean to say is that the minister will, will soon appear before parliament? Yes, yes, yes. The last time, the Honorable Minister was indisposed. He was indisposed in view of that the ministry wrote back to parliament to inform them that the Honorable Minister was indisposed and that if we could arrange for a different day, as we speak, the Honorable Minister will be in parliament tomorrow to address and explain the issue for everybody to understand that it is not a deliberate attempt that the Honorable Minister really want to be in Parliament. One, he was indisposed. Two, he is on top of issues regarding this bus. He is working tirelessly to ensure that we have the buses in adequacy so that the children of Ghana, the future of Ghana is restored. Mm. And so this is one thing that we want to assure Ghana that the ministry, the Ministry of Health, is ready and working hard to ensure that we have these vaccines. Uh, there are some media reports making the, making the rounds. Uh, of course, we're hearing, for instance, that the Ghana Health Service is uh, attributing this uh, uh, shortage to, for instance, the depreciation of the Ghana city. How, how true are these reports, for instance? Um, I have not... I'm not privy to that report, but however, what I will say is that procurement of vaccines takes a process. There are a number of processes involved from the Ministry of Health to uh, UNICEF, Gavi. There are a number of processes involved. So one way or the other, there could be a technical delay. These are part of issues that the Honorable Minister himself would speak to them on the floor of Parliament tomorrow. And on that issue, I will play that, will reserve that explanation for him because um, some of the issues that are coming up are new to him. As I speak to you last week, he summoned a complete meeting on this same issue. That let's look at how best and how possible. And let's stop whatever we are doing as a ministry and make sure that as soon as possible we have these vaccines in the system. Don't forget that there are a number of vaccines that we need as a country. Now we have COVID-19 vaccines in storage. We have other vaccines in storage. And so he will be there tomorrow, put everything on the table, and everybody will understand that. It's not a deliberate attempt that mm. we want to deny, or the Honorable Minister, or the Ministry want to deny the people of Ghana the vaccines, but rather technical issues which will be explained to him tomorrow on the floor of the Well, uh, it may not just be about the Ministry, but also parents who are out there and many of them are becoming very anxious. What, what do you have to say uh, to, to these lactating mothers and, and also the, uh, the I mean, family members who are getting worried that this situation might, might get out of control? You see, um, like I said, Hannibal Minister himself is a family man. Every member of the Ministry of Management Managers are all family members, family men who have their children involved in some of this uh, shortage or that. But we are appealing to the general public, educating mothers, parents, to exercise patience, and then we are assuring them that as early as possible, right now, everything is, the concentration is on the vaccines, how we can get vaccines distributed to the various hospitals so that parents can get access to them. What we would rather say is that they should be available, they should make themselves available for the those as they are invited that the buses are arrived because there are instances where buses are there and you are finding it difficult to get people to take their doors. But this one, we first of all we want to encourage them and entreat them to make themselves available because we are assuring them that from by tomorrow the Honorable, Honorable Minister himself will state clearly when we should expect the buses. And I know from the point that I'm speaking that he's working tirelessly and will ensure that we receive the vaccine. So parents are to be on that. Once the vaccine comes, we encourage everybody to go and take the vaccine. Mm. We I, I, are all aware of the challenges and the, the, the challenges that we are facing. And so we are pleading and pleading with the system that whatever the situation, vaccines will arise and we are encouraging them 
to make themselves available. Mm -hmm. Let's not forget to appreciate the effort of the Ghana Health Service, what they are doing to safeguard this system. They are working tirelessly, they are all contributing their quota, and they need to be recommended as well. Uh, and already, uh, some of the health groups are beginning to make suggestions as to how to prevent this uh, from recurring. For instance, the Pediatric Society making a recommendation uh, that we create a ring fence fund uh, for these essential vaccines, uh, a situation w which will make them, uh, the funding and the monies for them, untouchable. What are you able to, 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 to say on that, that recommendation that we set aside funding for this? Yes, I think that I, I side with them. In every incidence, there is a need for us to take a clue or learn something out of. And so what will lead, whatever possible leads to this particular survey, it means that the ministry would have to take note, and we have already taken note of it. Like I said, the Honorable Minister himself will be on the floor of parliament. And I can assure you that this shortage of buses will never occur to the people of Ghana again. It will never happen again. You're, you're making a promise? Delivery. You're making a po promise yeah, to the people of Ghana? I can, assure you, I can assure you on that because I know what management is doing. I know what the minister is doing. I know what the chief director is doing. I know the effort that every member of management is putting to ensure. And, and, and like I said, let's, let's deal with the issue. Sometimes it's, it's being dealt with personally that somebody is not doing something well. It's, it's a process. We get the verses from outside. We are supposed to procure, procurement processes. There are some times you might not get it right. There are times you might get it right. When we get it right, we should be praised. When we don't get it right and we have been uh, criticized, no problem about that. But we shouldn't personalize. This yes. is a system that has been with us all the time. And it is the same system we are going to use to make sure that we restore the sanity in the system. I can give you that around that. We have taken a clue of the technical challenge we have. And we are going to work on it as early as possible. And this will never be said. Okay, then. Uh, we'll leave it here for now. Isaac Ofeba, uh, Public Relations Officer at the Ministry of Health, uh, would also be looking forward to that address by the Minister of Health tomorrow. I am determined to fix the problem. That's the assurance from President Akufuado, who is promising to address the economic challenges confronting the nation. Ghana's economy is at the brink of collapse as the nation grapples to secure a crucial $1.7 billion external debt restructuring with China in order to pave way for the deal with the International Monetary Fund in terms of the bailout. Speaking of the Sister Sister Independence Day celebration in the Volta region, the president called for unity and collective efforts in ensuring Ghana's prosperity. Fellow Ghanaians, I'm very much aware of the current difficulties confronting our nation, and we are working hard to resolve them. But maybe we should also count our blessings in how together we are managing the difficulties. We all see the images around the world. Here in Ghana, we have not had any fuel queues. We have not suffered shortages of food and essential items or the catastrophe of Dubuso. Undoubtedly, major global developments have had a negative impact on our domestic economic performance. We have witnessed historic highs in global inflation and food prices, rising global interest rates triggered by tightening of monetary policy of central banks across several ad advanced economies to tame rising inflation. An energy crisis with crude oil prices reaching unprecedented highs at one point, at one point above $120 a barrel. The strengthening of the United States dollar against all other currencies. The tightening of global financing conditions, especially for emerging markets and developing economies and the large-scale disruption of the global supply chain. These phenomena have manifested in Ghana in the form of the depreciation of our currency, the decline in gross international reserves, high inflation, elevated debt burden, significant fiscal stress, constrained domestic and external financing, and reduced GDP. It is these that have brought hardships upon our people. Government has deployed a number of fiscal interventions to help bring relief to Ghanaians. And I'm confident that sooner rather than later, we will see significant results of relief and recovery.
Meanwhile, the president is assuring the economy will be reset to a period similar to the ones before COVID-19 and the Russian-Ukraine war. He's asking Ghanaians to trust the administration as he rolls out measures aimed at bringing the economy back to life when he appears uh, before Parliament on Wednesday. Significant fiscal stress constrained domestic and external financing and reduced GDP growth. It is these that have brought hardships upon our people. Government has deployed a number of fiscal interventions to help bring relief to Ghanaians. And I'm confident that sooner rather than later, we will see significant results of relief and recovery. In two days, on Wednesday, 8th March, I will in the Chamber of Parliament deliver a message on the state of the nation, where I'll delve into much greater detail the entirety of the package of policies government is implementing to bring back the days of rapid growth. Fellow Ghanaians, there is one thing I want all of us to remember, and that is that when I assumed office on 7th January 2017, I inherited a, severe, a severely challenged economy whose rate of growth at the time was the lowest in over two decades. By dint of hard work, prudence and creativity, we managed to turn things around, creating an economy which for the years 2017, 2018 and 2019, the years before the onset of COVID-19, was amongst the fastest growing economies not only in Africa, but also in the world, recording an annual GDP growth rate of 7%. We were the best place to do business in West Africa, and in 2021, we were described as the most attractive destination for investment in West Africa. The next 22 months of my mandate will be focused on restoring the economy we had before COVID-19 and the Russian invasion of Ukraine to the period of rapid growth. Meanwhile, well, scores of residents of uh, Nalerugu, Gambaga and Waliwali in the northeast region invaded the various groups uh, of the 66 uh, March uh, independence celebration uh, with placards and the wearing of some red bands in uh, protest against the government over what they say is its meddling in the Boku chieftaincy dispute. The overlord of the traditional area and president of the regional house of chiefs uh, also refused to grace the event as part of the protest. The event was however called off in the Treponi district due to insecurity following the renewal of some communal violence in the area. In his address at the regional capital, Nalerigu, the regional minister, uh, Mr. Zakaria Yidana, called on the people to live in peace and unity and ensure their differences must not always lead to conflicts. Elias Tanko has more. A nation divided cannot stand. A people so divided cannot also stand. We therefore need to be conscious of our actions and reactions that constitute a serious threat to the peace we are enjoying. These threats are mainly related to either land or chiefs. I therefore want to use this opportunity to call on all of us to live in peace and in unity. It behoves all to preserve and protect the peace that we are enjoying. We may have differences in opinion on matters of mutual interest, but these differences should not and must not lead to conflicts. The minister was speaking after inspecting the parade, which was made up of largely students and security personnel in the area. Mr. Zakaria also offered his commendation to the security agencies for securing the chiefs and people of the region. I want to give all the assurance that the region is very peaceful and shall continue to be. Thanks to the security agencies for securing the keys of the Northeast region. I want to help all to go about your legitimate daily duties without let or hindrance. At the end of the day, we shall come out of this situation better, stronger, and people united for a better future. This year's event, however, was celebrated differently in the region as some residents invaded the venues of the parade in Nalirgu, Gambaga and Waliwali to stage protests against the government. The king of Mamprugo and his elders were also not in attendance. The protesting residents also took part in the march as they brandished their placards with several inscriptions 
calling on the president and his government to stop meddling in the Boko skin dispute. The protest is in connection with the government's rejection of the new Boko Naba, Na Sheriga Sidu Abari, and the subsequent attempt to arrest the Manprugu king for the enskiment. In Nalirugu, the protest was led by the Nalirugu Youth Association. The group spokesman, Mahama Yamusa, spoke to Joy News. We have ever decided to use this opportunity to register our displeasure with the attitude of the president toward the people of Mount Purubu. We are not going to leave any stone and turn to make sure that the Goku Nava is sent home and uh, live with his people. Goku Nava, Sherga, Abari, Sebi. He is the one that is recognized by the traditional authority of Mount Purubu. Goku is the Mount Purubu. Boku is not of Nampuru. The Nairi is a law abiding citizen. He believes in his authority and he does what is expected of him. He doesn't go into any place. Nana, the new order for the arrest of our two women. The new order for the arrest of our two women. What is that? What message is that? We are allowed for you. If you think that you want to be here with us, we will not buy. We will agree. Ilias Sutanku. Reporting for Joy News. Well, let's stay on the Independence Day celebrations because uh, former President John Romani Mahama says he has worked out at the national event uh, in the Volta region because the ceremony has been politicized. He explains why. I just came from the Volta region. And just when I was leaving, they were preparing to celebrate the Independence Day. I stopped going to the Independence Day because it's become a party jamboree. I went to Tamale, they told GBC to take the camera off me. They bust their supporters in and filled the whole stadium. When I got into the stadium, the place was quiet. I went and sat. They gave me some corner somewhere and went and sat there. And they occupied the days. And any of them who came in, hey, hey. And I said, I don't want to be part of this party jamboree. Independence is a solemn national celebration. We should celebrate it at the Independence Square. And everybody wanted to come, could come. Today they bust their supporters in. They have party flags. They are wearing party t-shirts. I don't want to be part of a party jamboree. Nkrumah got us independence. I'm an Nkrumahist. I will attend an Independence Day any day if it's not hijacked by one party. Because it should be a national day for all of us. So I'm not going to be in hold tomorrow because I don't want to be part of an MPP jamboree. You watch what will happen tomorrow. They'll bust their people in and occupy that whole place. And so, but in any case, why should I be celebrating Independence Day? And as Nana said, today if you are a mother and you take your child to the hospital for vaccine, three vaccines are shot. First time since the Fourth Republic. So what are we celebrating independence when our children cannot get vaccines? My maternal sibling suffered from polio. He was crippled by polio. And so I know what polio is. And we've gained strength in the fight against polio. Fewer children are getting crippled by polio. Today our children cannot get polio vaccines, cannot get measles vaccines. And as long as we don't get it, the diseases are going to begin to spread again. And you're going to celebrate 66 years of independence. You celebrate it. I'm not going to be part of it. Well, uh, the celebration, however, took place in the central region. The regional minister, Justin Marigodasan, called for the support uh, for government policies to speed up the growth of the economy. The minister noted that the uh, education as a tool will help build a strong human resource that can engineer a change in the economic position of the region and the country in general. There's more in this report. The regional celebration of Ghana's 66th independence anniversary day was held at the Victoria Park in Cape Coast. Speaking at the celebration, the regional minister, Justina Mario Guerasan, encouraged the people to make use of the government free SHS policy and a technical and vocational policy to ensure that every child is educated. She emphasized that education is one of the ways out of poverty and should be utilized as a tool to bring an economic turnaround in the region and the country. I believe strongly that 
with education as a tool, we can build a strong human resource base which can change the economic story of the central region and Ghana in general. I therefore want to appeal to you all to make education a priority by taking advantage of the government's free senior high school policy and technical and vocational education policy to send your boys to school to acquire some knowledge and skills, which I believe is one of the surest ways we can come out of poverty. It is a fact that poverty poses threats to our unity and strength because the more people become poor, the more they resort to violence and other means to survive. As a Minister of State, my visit to Korea last year and my country glance at the success stories of most of the developed countries, especially the Asian Tigers, that Singapore, South Korea, Malaysia and Thailand, among others, brings to fore the importance of sound education programs. The key to their success is education, especially technical and vocational education. Emphasizing the theme of the occasion, she mentioned her administration's desire to create a comfortable and workable environment that will bring unity and consensus in policy implementation in the region and the country. She further expressed concern over the rate of involvement of some sections of the youth in social vices and admonished them to desist from such vices that affect the region as a whole and the country in general. But permit me to caution that the alarming rates at which some sections of youth are involved in all manner of social vices gives a cause for great concern to all well-meaning citizens of this dear country. Today we have the youth involved in armed robbery, internet fraud, drug trafficking, drug abuse, occultism, kidnapping, adoption of alien cultural values and practices that affect our socio-economic progress. Your region, our region, our beautiful central region and the country needs your energy, your dynamism, your creativity, above all, your dreams for development to push our country forward. I therefore urge all of you to resolve to support the Central Regional Coordinating Council in the implementation of the Central Regional Development Strategy and Transformation Agenda to create more avenues to attract more investments in the tourism industry, agro-processing and the service sectors to accelerate our rates of development. Rejoice, some of our questions report read to you. You're watching Join News Prime. We'll be back shortly. And in business incidents of extortion and illegal payments from the National Health Insurance Scheme, members were noticed to be uh, occurring at some health provider sites in the Ashanti region. According to the Ashanti Regional Director of the National Health Insurance Authority, the situation nearly eroded the confidence in the public which they had in the scheme. Given this, a co-payment committee has been set up to investigate and tackle the running illegality. Speaking at the National Health Insurance Authority Ashanti Region end of the year 2022 performance review, he cautioned health facilities and health workers to desist from the practice. Colleagues, there were some uproar and anxiety of NHIS members regarding extortion and illegal payments at some provider sites, which nearly eroded the confidence the public had in their scheme. As a result of this unfortunate situation, a national co-payment committee was formed and inaugurated by the chief executive to fight this canker to restore the enviable image of the national insurance scheme. As you are no doubt aware, similar committees at the regional and district levels have been formed and are already in operation. I encourage every one of us to rigorously fight against the notorious school payments and illegal fees collections at some provider sites. I urge all health providers in the Ashanti region to desist from such practices which have the tendency to reduce the confidence of the populace in the national health insurance scheme. The end of the year will assess the authorities' performance for 2022 and outline its commendation plan this year. 
The authority 2022 generated 300,518 Ghana cities for its flagship project, 1,000K for Health Strategy, which caught support from interested individuals to pay and underwrite subscription fees for children under 18. The authority targets universal health coverage in the region and the country at large by 2030. Director of the Middle Belt National Health Insurance Authority, Kwejo Trinibua Kudia, charged workers to ensure 80% enrollment to satisfy Ghana's quest to attain universal health coverage. Anytime I see staff of NHIA, it gives me joy. Because the work of NHIA, for me, can be equated to service to humanity and trying to make sure that the poor and vulnerable are well catered for. If we are able to get everybody registered or get up over 90% or 80% people registered, then Ghana would have achieved UAC in terms of membership. And if that will happen, it depends on you and I. Over 80% of people who visit our health facilities now go with NHI cards. So what this simply means is that our major financing mechanism in this country is the NHIS. So we need to up our game. The authority is hopeful that it will surpass its target at the end of 2023. Reporting for Joy News, Clinton Yeboa. And let's stay in the Shanti region because 10 startups in Kumasi have com uh, completed a six month business development incubation uh, training. Beneficiary entrepreneurs were supported to develop their green business plan and improve access to funding. The program afforded the startups networking opportunities and business expert knowledge. The ultra competitive business world, lack of knowledge and skills have been identified as blockages to many business startups from operating efficiently and successfully. Beneficiaries of the Recycle Lab Ghana and the SNV Green Incubation Program will tackle the lack of business training and shape their businesses into viable ones. The graduation ceremony was themed Boosting Green Employment and Enterprise Opportunities in Ghana. The ceremony featured the graduation of cohorts 3 and 4 of the green incubation program who are in the fields ranging from fashion, catering and food processing. Project lead for Recycle Up Ghana, Aqua Obinche, indicated that the training emphasizes efforts to ensure environmental consciousness whilst making profits. Throughout the six months incubation program, we were able to support these businesses, hone their business, shape their businesses into a viable one so as to make sure that they are able to make the three P's happen. That is, they have the people in mind, they have profits, of course, in mind, and also they think about about the planet as well. Corporate trainer Miss Rita Krampa encouraged beneficiaries to uphold entrepreneurship and sustainable business ethics. You can also create job to be an employer and also create jobs for other people. And then people will rather come to apply to you. And by so doing, you've created a job and you recreate just as you told our, your story. Respect time of your employees, time of your team, your customers, your business partners. When they say 2 o'clock, it is not 2, 2 30. A fashion designer and beneficiary, Gladys Che Oforiwa, is very happy the training has been an eye opener. I realized that there were a lot of things that I didn't know, like my financials, registering my business, how to search for open markets, a whole lot. I didn't know all that. But upon coming here, I got the insight on how to take proper financials, how to know the market, and also how to be investor ready for a business like mine. So I'm very grateful to SMV and Recycle Lab for what they've taught me and how far they've brought my business. Thank you. Thank you. Beneficiaries were awarded certificates and citations. The Boosting Green Employment and Enterprise Opportunities in Ghana Green Project is a four-year project implemented in the Ashanti and Western regions of Ghana. The project is an European Union-funded program that SNV Ghana is implementing with the United Nations Capital Development Fund. The project seeks to support the development and scale-up of businesses in the agriculture sector, renewable energy and water and sanitation sector. It targets young people between the ages of 15 and 35. Reporting for Joy News, Clinton.
And that's it for business. Next is sports. And you're welcome back. Government says it has impacted the lives of nearly 3 million senior high school graduates since the inception of the Free Senior High School program. That's according to the Deputy Minister responsible for Education, Dr. Uh, that's Mr. John Intim Fojo, speaking at a congregation ceremony at the University of Cape Coast. Uh, Intim Fojo indicated that government will ensure that the dream of every child who is of school going age will not be truncated. There's more in this report. John Intim Fojo says government has been able to achieve a pre-primary enrollment of 100%. And for the senior high school education, the successes are enormous. Speaking at a graduation of students from the College of Distance Education and the School of Graduate Studies at the University of Cape Coast, Mr. Intim Fodjo explained how the Ministry of Education is focusing on transforming the youth of Ghana. I want to ensure that the curriculum that has been reformed, that is transformed, that is imbibing in the communication critical skills and creativity critical thinking and creativity becomes a reality that once a child completes six years of basic education their learning achievement must be competitive as the one that is gained any part of the world when the government is investing heavily in ensuring that the dream of the child in my village the dream of the child is warungu to azim to Asin Krua, to Busmaji, and Jalukope is realized in becoming a professor, a teacher, a lawyer, clergyman, a nurse, or medical professional, it's not truncated by systemic barriers, and it's not truncated by economic barriers. The introduction of free SHS has, since 2016, its introduction become very meaningful and transforming many lives and giving opportunities to millions of students. Before the introduction of free SHS, data has it that nearly 120,000 students, very bright students with bright features, were truncated and could not transition to SHS because they didn't have the wherewithal. The average enrollment at secondary level before the introduction of free SHS was 830,000. Just this year, with the ongoing placement and enrollment of the current DVET and SHS students, 500,000 over students have been placed. And by the time the enrollment is complete. And that's all we have for you here on Join News Prime. I'm Blessed Sugan. Log on to myjoyonline.com. We have a lot of stories for you there. Bye bye for now.